All right, welcome to lecture three, control design using a root locus. This is 4418 control systems, and I'm James Friend. All right, the objectives of this course, is, this particular lecture, is to learn when the root locus method may be used to design a single input, single output control system, or to see about how it is used for a collection of typical compensators. And I do want to say here, really, typical compensators, <clears throat> both cascade and feedback. We're not going to worry about feed uh, forward or some other sort of fancy uh, compensation scheme. Those compensation methods work, uh, but uh, we're not going to worry about it in a minute here. To calculate the actual performance of some example systems with and without compensation based on the root locus method. So if we take a look at a specific objective, for example, uh, we have an antenna here, um, and we're trying to point it. And we could worry about how it points you know, vertically, but this particular setup only worries about how it's pointing horizontally. And we have a potentiometer, and the, the guy in the, control, um, in, the, in the control box actually is looking here, and he's wanting to rotate it, say. And he can put in the desired azimuth angle uh, here, uh, as defined by the potentiometer, and then you have a differential amplifier and power amplifier. The differential ampl amplifier is exactly that. Um, when it, and there's a difference between the desired angle and uh, the output angle, then there is some, it actually amplifies that signal and feeds that to the motor. And there's a gearing mechanism and so forth that tells it where it's, where it's at in the horizontal axis, about a vertical axis, I should say. So we've got that, an antenna azimuth position control system. And then what we're hoping to find is, you know, at, at the end of this, is that hopefully what you can figure out is the following, that um, you need to have a system that will give you less than or equal to 25% overshoot. So in the system response, uh, whenever you're looking at the actual angle that you're getting out of the system, um, this is the commanded value here, so that's the input value. And when it overshoots, you want to make sure that that doesn't overshoot too much. And what I mean by too much is 25% away or above from the commanded value. And that it does this basically in two seconds with a settling time. And we were talking about that, we're talking about usually like a 4% settling time. So it falls within 4% uh, of the final settling, uh, final value within two seconds. And then our, our error constant, velocity error constant, is approximately equal to 20, right? Remember, a case of V is, is uh, the velocity error constant. And roughly speaking, the larger this number, the lower the, the steady state error should be. Furthermore, we can say that, you know, in this case, then if we look back, we can say, all right, this, this particular part, the case of V is equal to 20, that's the steady state. Uh, specs, and this this other part. Well, that's all. That's transient. Okay, so this is when t is the time is small, and really this other part is when time uh, after a long time or time goes to infinity. It's a DC or the final response of the system. Okay, so that we'd say that those kind of behaviors are defined as as performance specifications. And so if we look at transient behavior, you know, we'd, we'd see these sorts of things. Um, what we're looking at here is in the time domain and time versus um, the, uh, the output of the system C of T. And this is maybe the maximum output of the system. And that's the peak time T sub P. And then as we come up here, okay, from 10% uh, of the final value, to when it reaches 90% uh, of the final value, that's called the rise time. So the rise time, right, is is from the, the time at which it's uh, at 0 0.1 uh, C final. And then, um, so that's with a minus sign. And then we add in 0 0.9, the, C, the final uh, rise time. And so it's the difference between the two, really. And then we also have uh, the steady state um, time as well, T sub S there. And this, again, is um, there are different kinds of, of boundaries here we might define. And this is actually the 4% uh, steady state error here. 
All right, so the settling time to T sub S is defined here in terms of a 4% error from the, uh, from the final steady state value. And we'd also say that, you know, there, there's these equations from the second year. Uh, percentage overshoot is equal to the exponential of minus zeta times pi divided by 1 minus zeta, and this zeta is a damping coefficient. Right? And zeta can be related back. If we undo this equation, we can go back and look at how zeta is defined in terms of percentage overshoot. And we'll have an occasion you actually use this equation a lot more than this other equation. Zeta, the damping coefficient, if you know what the percentage overshoot is here, then it's the minus log of percentage overshoot divided by 100 divided by the square root of pi squared plus the quantity log of the square root of uh, the percentage of overshoot divided by 100 squared. All right. Another way to look at the overshoot uh, percentage is really the, the maximum here. Okay, uh, minus the, the final amount here, okay, or C final, C max and C final. Take the, the difference between the two. Max, of course, would be larger, so you say C max minus C final divided by C final. Multiply that against 100, and then you'll get the percentage overshoot. Settling time is T sub S. The rise, sub, rise time, there's your settling time. Rise time is TR, that's your rise time here. Peak time, of course, that's when it reaches its maximum value is T sub P. And then steady, so this is all associated with the transient behavior. Steady state error we talked about from the first lecture. So with root locus design, it's most useful when the specifications are given in the time domain. Um, because really root locus uh, techniques uh, although the, the plots are made in the S plane, you know, the complex plane with the real part and the imaginary part, when we're talking about actually designing controllers using root locus techniques, um, we often talk about the uh, percentage overshoot, settling time, and so forth, and those are all in the time domain. When we say design, what does that really mean? Um, I mean it could mean really a lot of things, but what we're really talking about is we're going to modify the root locus um, by adding poles and zeros to the system. So we might have an original system that looks, you know, I don't know, something like, like this. So we have a pair of poles. Between the poles, we'd have um, uh, some sort of root locus. And then, well, we'd have a breakaway point here where it would go to our finite zero. Same number of poles as the zeros. So presumably, that would be our root locus. Well, what would happen then if we went and, and stuck in a couple of extra zeros over here? Well, we'd have to have uh, some of this, this actually, this root locus would shift slightly, and then we'd have actually part of the system come in from infinity. So by doing that, by adding poles and zeros to the system, we can modify the system's behavior. And when I say system, I mean closed loop uh, system, not the open loop system. Because remember, when you're talking about uh, open loop system, these are the open loop system responses. And as you change the gain in the closed loop system, um, the, the gain will sweep, cause the closed loop poles to move along the root locus from the, the poles to the zeros. So we're talking about really modifying what the, the closed loop system is doing. Nothing much we can do with the open loop system. After all, uh, if you start adding poles and zeros to the system, really you're talking about doing that with the closed loop system. So in other words, we're adding new devices, in other words, uh, controllers to the system by and, and giving compensation to the system through these controllers. And <coughs> there's a couple of different ways to you know, do these things. One of the simplest things to do is actually uh, change, the, the change where the closed loop poles are um, by changing the gain, for example. So maybe we have um, an open loop system that has an unstable behavior. But um, if we increase the gain, we can cause the, the poles to be over here. Okay, and as you increase the gain, the, the system becomes, uh, becomes stable then. And so this is where, this is how K would be increasing. Okay, so eventually as the, the closed loop poles get over on the left-hand side, the system becomes stable. That isn't what we're talking about at all. I mean, that's... That's nice to be able to do, but that's already with the closed-loop system as it is. We're actually talking about changing the behavior of that closed-loop system 
by by changing the dynamics of it with this this controller. Very often, there's very little. Uh, there's not. You can't do enough just with this whatever you have with your root locus already. You have to actually modify the root locus to get where you want to go. <coughs> Excuse me. Two forms of compensation are most common. Uh, series or cascade and parallel or feedback compensation. Um, almost universally in here, we'll be using a series cascade. Parallel feedback can be converted to a series cascade form, and indeed, you can actually convert any kind of uh, compensation form into the series cascade form, and, and the variables all end up being in different places in the equations, but it all works the same. So if we focus on series cascade methods, then more or less you're learning all the methods and, and save us a bit of trouble in doing some of those other things. Now, we could use lag, lead, lag lead, PI, PD, and PID controllers, and I hope you got the kind of uh, the, the idea behind that from the, uh, the, from the first lecture and the second lecture there, uh, what we were talking about with all these different controllers and so forth. And we're going to go through some of these things now. For a moment here, let's talk about, though, if we're going to have a single input, single output system, um, what we're doing is we're actually taking a single input, single output system and then improving it by inserting a compensator in there. And this compensator is like a continuous time filter placed within this fixed plant G of S. Wh what we're saying is, is that, all right, if we have a system that we already have fixed up like this, and maybe we've already closed the loop, all right, so there's G, all right, and just for argument's sake, let's argue that it's just going to be unit feedback. It doesn't really matter anyway, because um, we could convert it to this. And so then there's our system, okay, such as it is. And with this system, we're getting an output and we're, we're having input. The funny part of it is, is that whatever kind of input we put in, we're not getting the output we want, and this isn't going to work. So we're saying, all right, let's modify this arrangement. So this part actually puts, gives the plant what we want to, what we want to give it so that we get what we want out of it. So we're going to put in here this extra box say, in front of the G, so that this is what we'd normally be putting into G, but we're going to take that and actually translate it into something else that uh, is more along the lines of what we want. The compensators, poles, and zeros are placed to obtain the desired response, and the whole trick behind this is, is that actually figuring out uh, where to put those so that you get exactly what you want, and it, in some ways, is more art than science. Root locus plots, though, tell us all possible locations of the system poles its gain, as its gain has changed. So one of the nice things about this is, is that as you move the gain around, you can actually uh, use that to tell you uh, what's going to happen for the system, regardless of whatever the gain might be. So what you do is, by putting the compensator in there, or you change the dynamics of the system for all possible values of the gain, and you can see what the effect of the gain would be for your new system. And then you go in and you, all right, so then once you have your new system with a compensator in there, then you can change the gain to get what you want. Now, the technique is typically called placing the poles, uh, one of the techniques that we can talk about here. By closing a loop on a system when the open loop poles is shown, and we can actually place the poles where we want. So remember, this, these poles here, like here and here, Okay. These are the open loop poles, and these are, and when I say open loop, here's the, the, the regular feed forward part. And if you do have an H, what we'll say is that it still is there, and it's actually having some sort of effect on the output, but that the, the, the input is no longer there, because this connection has been severed. And so then the open loop transfer function, remember, is, is just G times H. Turns out that that's because we still have this H stuck in here on the on the other side. Um, it still affects the behavior. Closed loop transfer function, on the other hand, when we actually connect this together and we have uh, it actually with negative feedback, like this, uh, then then we end up with a closed loop transfer function as shown um, here, and we end up with G H. Uh, sorry, G over one plus G H. So we can adjust the gain or, or whatever to place its, the poles at point A, say, um, right here, if we want for a particular uh, closed-loop system um, here. 
So the open loop system has its poles um, along these points uh, here, here, and here. But the closed loop poles can be here, here, and say here if we uh, close the loop and then start adjusting the gain. And we can move these along the lines here. If you don't quite understand what's going on here, I suggest trying it out in MATLAB and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. But usually what ends up happening is, is that where you want the poles to be is actually totally removed from where the root locus is. So suppose we want, you know, suppose you're able to put the poles here at an A and A prime, and we need to actually have the poles entirely on a place where it's off the root locus. No matter what you do with the gain, you're never going to actually be able to get out to this point B with where your poles, closed loop poles, are at. So, for example, um, where your poles are, when your poles are at A, okay, it gives you a certain amount of damping and, and it's maybe what you're looking for. Problem of it is, is that maybe the the response isn't quick enough. If you had your poles at B like you want, then the response time uh, to the peak, time to the peak response, for example, is far shorter than if you have your poles at A. So, you know, when you have only the gain to adjust, there's only so much you can actually do. And ideally, we'd like to be able to move the root locus so that you have more flexibility. You actually can move the, the response to the system, the, the, the closed loop poles, anywhere in this plane. So, what we'll actually be able to do is, by, by compensating the system, we can get what we want by adding poles and zeros to the overall, uh, overall uh, system itself. Now, uh, things to remember here, if you add poles, it generally moves the root loci to the right in the S-parameter space. So uh, whenever you plot the S-plane and the root locus, that the, the, the response of the closed loop trunk and the poles as you change the gain k, all of that stuff kind of tends to move towards the right. And by adding poles into the system, just generally speaking, it tends to destabilize the system. Integral control adds a pole at the origin, so 1 over s. If you say you're going to add an integrator into the system, that's simply a pole at the origin, and it reduces st system stability. It furthermore slows down the settling of the response. The system is, in a sense, more skittish. It, it refuses to settle down, and it takes a longer time to, to actually uh, settle down into the steady state values. Let's look at some of the responses as an example. This left-hand uh, case, we have a single pole, okay, and that's the open loop pole of the system. And you'll notice that as we increase the gain, the, the closed loop pole would be moving farther and farther to the left, and no matter what we do, it's always stable, all right? So the system's always going to be stable because the closed loop pole is always on the left-hand side. And in fact, <coughs> what we can see is, is that the system becomes more and more stable um, in proportion to the increase in the gain. So as we increase the gain, the system becomes more and more stable. Well, if we add a second pole here, all right, then what ends up happening is, is that the, instead of it moving towards the left, we actually have the <coughs> root locus actually go to plus infinity and minus infinity along the uh, parallel to the j omega axis. What that says is, is that over here we had it uh, set up so that as the gain increases, the stability increases. Well, as the gain increases, the system actually grows more and more unstable. Remember, look at your damping here. The damping line that will tell you what the angle is here, and the cosine of that angle is referred back to the, 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 the damping coefficient. The damping coefficient goes down, 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 until it, basically, if it goes way up here to, say, plus infinity, then basically the damping coefficient is zero, and the system is only neutrally stable at best. So by adding a pole, again, the system has become slightly more unstable. If we add a third pole, we had this one added in in B, okay, but now here we've added in here for C, then, all right, well, we're kind of back to the original system. Remember, we have three poles with no zeros that are in the finite plane, so we have th three asymptotes. Look, we have one asymptote here along uh, 180 degrees. We have two asymptotes, uh, plus 90 degrees, and then minus 90 degrees, by the way. And then now we have uh, three asymptotes, um, 180 degrees. And then we have another one at 60 degrees, and then a third one at minus 60 degrees. So one of these, one of these poles, as we go from open loop poles and increase the gain, 
the closed loop poles will progressively become more stable for this particular this particular pole. But what about the other two? Well, we have one here and we have one here as the gain goes up and then they, they, they break away from the real axis. And as we increase the gain, suddenly these two poles will go unstable. So the whole system will become unstable. All we did is we added two poles from our original system. Adding poles makes the system more unstable. And if you notice, all of the locus is over here on the left-hand side. And okay, and then here, all of the root locus is sort of isolated between two numbers, real numbers. Over here, all of the root locus, actually, a majority of the root locus is now moving over to the right-hand side. If we keep adding poles, the the root locus will actually get farther and farther. Most of the root locus will be farther and farther towards the right. Again, it becomes more unstable. Here's an example uh, from taken from out of Nice, for example. If we have two poles here and there's a response, there's a third pole, and we actually add the fourth pole, as I was mentioning before. And depending on the, the values of the parameters that we might use, you can force the system to be neutrally stable or, or actually go unstable for certain values of gain. And if we add a fifth pole, or I'm sorry, if we actually, uh, instead of having two, uh, four real poles, we have two uh, real poles and two complex poles, those additional set of complex poles actually forces part of the system to be to become unstable. All right. So keep these things in mind as you're you know as you're going through. You can actually use this to design the system. So if the system is too stable or too slow in responding, then you can pop in a pole. You can put in an integrator to actually help you uh, get uh, a quicker response out of the system at the risk of making it unstable. Zeros, on the other hand, do exactly the opposite thing in every sense. Instead of moving to the right, they move, adding the zero moves the root locus to the left. It tends to stabilize the system. And it speeds up the settling of a response. So let's look. If we have, as in the previous example from C, when we had one, two, three poles, and we had no zeros, and of course we have plus 60, minus 60, and then 180 asymptotes, now let's add in a zero. Well, not only does it provide a place for this closed loop pole to go to, it also, uh, which might make you think, all right, well, I thought this was supposed to make it more stable. And it actually, as we increase the gain, it stops it here. But look at what happens to the, the uh, closed loop poles that propagate out of those open loop poles over here on the right-hand side. We have a breakaway point now, very much like we had over here, but curiously, no matter what we do, we cannot make the system go unstable. It can be marginally stable, but not unstable. And watch what happens if we take that zero and move it actually over here closer to the origin. The key here is the effect of an added pole or zero is stronger, okay, it's stronger if it is closer to the origin. All right, so what we've done here is we haven't changed the number of zeros, we've just moved where the zero is, and we're going to move it closer to the origin. Well, you can notice that it can become marginally unstable here if we increase the gain enough, but over here, it actually remains quite nicely stable, all right, until we get very large values of gain. And if we keep moving that zero even farther, here, the, the zero was here before, and now we moved it over here, the system actually swaps where, you notice that the, the root locus used to be here, and, and then it used to be over here, and it had a zero here, and all of that's been undone now. So now that we've moved this, now that we've moved this zero over here, we can see that the root locus is even farther away from the, the imaginary axis. So there's a couple of different ways that you can manipulate the system when you're trying to design it. You can keep adding in extra little items. Sometimes that can be done, sometimes not, to strengthen the effect. So you can keep adding in more poles to make the system more unstable. Or you can move the pole or zero closer to the origin to strengthen its effect 
as a single unit on the overall system. Let's take another look here. You can have, for say, for example, the addition of a real zero here, and you have a pair of poles, okay? And say so I have a pair of poles here, and it depends on our values of, of, uh, of our system and what kind of response we might end up with. And if we go to a complex system, you notice we have a breakaway to the, oops, sorry about that, we have a breakaway to these, these zeros. If we didn't have these zeros in here, the system would go straight to infinity. Um, parallel to the J omega axis, just like over here. But when we add the zero, it actually curves around over here and then replants itself into the real axis. Um, okay, it, it arrives back in at the real axis and then propagates to that, to that zero that's finite and then a zero that happens to be infinite. Similarly here, if we have a pair of complex zeros and a pair of complex poles, we no longer have any asymptotes that the system has to go from these complex poles to those complex zeros. And you can move these around to tell the system where you want it to go if the gain goes to infinity. Similarly here, we had our three poles. And then depending on where we have our zero, we can manipulate where the, what the system is doing. Um, when we didn't have the zero in here, the system had a response that became unstable. With the zero in here, the system always remains stable. <coughs> 